what coaches most enjoy about the new football season. Completely refurbished, laminated, color-coded play charts. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to our Labor Day uh, version of Park Ridge Sports History. And this week I'd like to focus on college football, but particularly one season and one team and maybe one coach, and that is Frank Burns of the 19, oh, sorry, not this Frank Burns. I know everyone always confuses him, but this Frank Burns, the 1976 head coach of the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, the undefeated Rutgers Scarlet Knights, and they have a bit of controversy surrounding that team, and I'd like to kind of analyze that whole 76 season from a Rutgers perspective and also from a college football fan uh, perspective uh, in, in this show. And of course, I didn't get an actual photograph of Frank Burns. I got a drawing or illustration by, to me, the legendary cartoonist from both the Newark Evening News and then the Star Ledger, Bill Canfield, one of my all time favorite cartoonists. Not just, and I knew him as a kid, as a sports cartoonist. And I did have a chance to speak with him many, 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 many years ago uh, just to talk to him about cartooning and all the rest of it because I didn't know how much I really want to spend uh, working on cartoons. But I tell you, I really grew a love for it when I saw that I can go into my real love of sports and use artwork to express my ideas, opinions, and perspectives about all of the games, particularly uh, the, the big four, football, hockey, basketball, and baseball. And of course, my love for college football is a result of having a father who was a big Notre Dame fan. My first actual event was 1969, October 11th, going to a uh, Yankee Stadium to see Army versus Notre Dame. And this is when Notre Dame had Joe Theismann, from uh, New Jersey. I think he was, I want to say South River. And I think Drew Pearson was also uh, at that high school. I don't know whether they played together or not. Uh, maybe they missed by a year. I wasn't too sure about that. But Frank Burns, local product, Roselle Park, goes on to play for Rutgers, quarterback, and then um, takes over when John Bateman retires. And actually leads, I think, Rutgers to the most wins in university history. And I know that I did post this picture of Frank Burns, of course, the legendary Larry Linville from uh, the MASH episodes, a show I have enjoyed in the past. And Frank Burns, unfortunately, did kind of at the tail end of his career kind of get a lot of criticism. But when you take a look at what he actually was able to do, the impact he actually had on Rutgers athletics, particularly the football team, I don't really think Rutgers, without that 76 team and undefeated, is in the Big Ten today. Or there would, uh, or uh, the talk of a potential Big East conference of football that at one time Joe Paterno wanted with Penn State, Syracuse, Boston College, uh, Pitt. Rutgers and Merlin being involved in. Well, that never took place. But look at what all of these kind of isolated incidents led to. Rutgers having the undefeated season. And we'll go into an analysis of the teams that they played and all the rest of it. Uh, Penn State kind of pushing for this. And then ultimately the big conferences, the big football conferences like the SEC, the Big Ten, the Pac-10 and stuff, realizing what was on the horizon and basically taking these teams maybe out of geographical region and putting them into their own conferences. And now we have five big superpower conferences in college football and other schools trying to get to that level. Well, in a certain way, Rutgers and that 76 season had something to do with it. And that was this. Well, let's just take a look at what happened in 1976. Rutgers finishes the season 11-0. and They win on a Thursday night. And here's the incredible thing. When I was doing the research on uh, the Rutgers football team from 1976, and of course, a shout out to Sports Reference, but I, I've used other materials as well. And 
let me just say this. I have no affiliation whatsoever with sports reference outside of shooting them a couple of emails telling them how great a site it is for guys like me to go and do some research and investigate and get the facts and the schedules and all the rest of it. And they have done a tremendous job, particularly with college football and basketball, kind of cobbling together all these teams where they have maybe have lost information or, or data uh, on particular seasons and all the rest of it. They've really done an incredible job. But I went and I used the sports reference for a top 20 uh, of the teams and see kind of like, did Rutgers kind of fit in? I'm going to leave that up to you, the viewers. Um, I'm going to, and you can synthesize all of the information I'm going to give you. And maybe there's information I've let out not intentionally, of course, just not available to me. And you decide, did Rutgers, um, did they really deserve to be in the final top 20? Now, here's the argument for Rutgers. They were one of two teams to finish undefeated that year. Pitt, of course, winning the national title, Pitt having Tony Dorsett, Pitt having the Heisman Trophy winner in Dorsett. I think their quarterback was Matt Cavanaugh. They actually had a kid from uh, my hometown of Verona on that team, Willie Taylor. And the reason I bring up Verona is because uh, Jimmy Hughes, who played linebacker for Rutgers, was a big cog in that number one defense for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. He only allowed 81 points that year to finish number one defensively in the nation, which probably really is evidence or a good reason to put them in the top 20. Now, before I say, do I think they, they, they should have been, let's just take a look and analyze some of the records and some of the other teams that were in the top 20. First of all, Pitt finishing number one. I always look at it this way. There is something special about being undefeated in league play or in the uh, overall season that you had. I don't care whether you're playing in an over 65 softball league on Saturdays or you are in the NFL like the Miami Dolphins. It is special. It is really rare. It's not something that they do all the time. I mean, just think about it this way, college football fans. How many seasons has really Alabama finished unbeaten? Now, they've had a dynasty under Saban. He's won uh, numerous national titles. What, five, I, I think, as I'm, I'm starting to remember off the top of my, my head? Clemson, also another couple of, uh, you know, they've won a title. But in the years that they didn't, you know, they might have gone the whole year and gone into the final game and lost. So they're not undefeated. Now, you can argue, well, Going 11-1 and one is tougher to do for Alabama than Rutgers going 12-0. and 0. That's not really the issue. The issue is, wow, they faced all their opponents, they defeated all of their opponents, and they did what they had to do. And it is kind of special. And that's my point. Now, in context, here was the deal with Rutgers. Yes, these were some of the teams on, well, these are all the teams that they played, all 11. I think I have all 11 here. Rutgers played a number of Ivy League schools. Who were they? Princeton, Cornell, and Columbia. I love the Columbia logo. I got a different logo here. Uh, I was frustrated by the Navy logo. I love the cartoonish Navy goat. This is just an aside. But some for some reason, and I'm not great with the computer, I couldn't cut copy-paste. Uh, the Navy logo that I wanted. Uh, they played two teams from what used to be or members of the Yankee Conference, and that was UConn and UMass. As a kid, and I'm just doing this as an aside because I'm just talking all co things college football with uh, the emphasis on that Rutgers team, but I remember as a kid watching the Prudential College scoreboard on Saturday afternoons, probably about – 4.30 to 6 o'clock, the day growing shorter and night approaching. And I just remember it was, you just, as a kid, you just visualize it. You just done raking. Uh, it took you the whole day to rake. We had a big backyard with lots of leaves, let me tell you. And it took us all day. We would end it. We would play a little football. Then we'd come inside. My father would be watching. 
I mean, he was nonstop work even on the weekends, but he would take a, a few minutes and watch college football because he loved it. Even if Notre Dame wasn't on, he loved college football and he really inspired me to become a, a big fan of it. Anyway, either between the halves or at the end of a game, they would go to the Prudential College scoreboard. And what made it so great, and I wish I could find it again, and I actually wish that ESPN or let's say Fox or ABC or CBS would return at least, you know, they have the retro jerseys and the retro logos and the retro games. I wish they would go to a retro scoreboard because it was name tags and they would slide them in and then they would click the uh, scores of the game. And occasionally when you're doing the games, they would have the finals 45, 34, all in, Everything was black and white because we had black and white set. I don't know whether they had the name tags in uh, color or not. doesn't matter. It was just very cozy, very campy, obviously. It was just boards up there and stuff. But you would see, sometimes they would update the score as they were doing the game. And it was click, 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 and they would change the scores. But I remember that they would try to uh, – ABC would try to do it by conference or division in a kind of like a – uh, geographical or logical way and progress. And I remember seeing Yankee Conference and it was UMass and they would spell out Massachusetts. And I always thought, man, it has one long name. But I always remember it was Massachusetts first Connecticut. <laughs> I, I would sit there and say, wow, they almost didn't get either name uh, of the full state or school up on the board. It was also a time that as a kid, I couldn't believe that a food staple was also a name of a university, and they played somewhere in, deep in the South. And, of course, that school was Rice University. And they were always getting their clock cleaned by Texas. It was always like 54 to 3 as a kid. That's how I remember. But I was always impressed that we actually had a college named after a food staple. <laughs> and then, of course, the other one was, I couldn't believe we also named a school after a toothpaste. And, of course, everyone everyone knows who I'm talking about. And that's Colgate University, who ironically was the last victim of Rutgers. They actually played, and I was doing the research on this, uh, Rutgers actually played Colgate. I do remember watching the game, and it was a Thanksgiving night. I always thought it was a Friday night, but uh, from what I've I, I, I seen, they played them on Thanksgiving night. It was cold, about 30 degrees, and they played them at the Meadowlands. And interestingly enough, I am sure that one, and I can't remember this, so this is not gospel truth on this, but I'm almost sure that Rutgers moved not only the venue from Rutgers to the Meadowlands, but that they moved the day of the game, and so they pushed it up from, let's say, Saturday to Thursday night. And I'm sure that ABC said, look, you have an unbeaten team. This would be fun for America. It's kind of like a filler game for us. We know that people are going to watch it because it is Thanksgiving, and maybe with the two NFL games being played, maybe uh, fans would be happy to see another game, because sometimes you get into that rhythm where you just want to see football, football, football. So it worked. And the game was kind of exciting. I don't recall every in and out. I just remember that Jimmy Hughes, they had mentioned he was from Verona, so I always thought that was kind of cool. Uh, he did make a couple of big plays in the game, and I think it did come down to a final play where Colgate was stopped at the goal line, and I think the score is 17-9. So they could have technically probably tied the game and tarnished Rutgers' uh, season. But Rutgers made a defensive stop, which probably was uh, the, not just the key to that game, but really the key to the season because Rutgers only allowed 81 points. They were the number one defensive team in the land. Of course, take that in context. But let's take that in context. And let's not knock a team that went undefeated. And let me also say, the Rutgers is not one of my favorite schools. As, as I went to Seton Hall, so you know that there's a built-in natural rivalry. And, of course, uh, that Rutgers team of 76 really uh, well, bookended that whole 1975-76 and then 76. Rutgers seemed to have like a revival of college sports there because of the basketball team was undefeated during the regular season, makes the Final Four, loses to Michigan and then UCLA in the Final Four. Uh, 
in the 75-76 season. So there was a lot going on in that New Brunswick campus. And they were having a very successful athletic year in terms of football and basketball. And why I say this is a important component is that Burns was their coach. He took over for John Bateman. I believe he is the winningest coach in Rutgers history or maybe second. The Rutgers team, though, they had a ton of Ivy League teams that they played that year. And, of course, that's why the uh, critics of that program. But you got to remember this, too. You know, the Ivy Leagues was once a huge power in college football. In fact, uh, they were probably, some of those teams were the big powers on the same level as the Michigans and Ohio States at one point. Okay, they have come down now. But you got to remember this, Rutgers was still playing traditional rivals. But as you can see by the logos on this page, you see that Rutgers is moving up in terms of the quality of powers that they were playing. Now, Louisville, Navy, and Tulane were probably the three biggest schools that they played that year. Now, Navy's not Ohio State, but they have a football tradition. They've never won a national title like Army has. But they had some great seasons there with people like uh, Joe Bellino and Roger Staubach. They did go to big-time uh, college football bowl games like the Cotton Bowl. They um, maybe they weren't on the same realm as the Alabamas or the Notre Dames and all the rest of it, but they had their seasons and they were seen as a college or seen as a traditional college power. All right. Tulane, very similar. I, I always equate Tulane football to, to kind of like Syracuse football. And what I mean is Tulane's had some good seasons, but they've been wrapped around by many years of mediocrity or six and five ledgers. And of course, one thing they have going against them is the fact that they will never be on the same level as LSU. And of course, the funny thing is, speaking of LSU, um, did anyone see the number of teams that were uh, ranked this week that got their clocks cleaned? I'm talking about North Carolina going into preseason number 10 or going into the season number 10. Indiana lost, and I, I saw great things. Now, listen, Indiana lost to Iowa 17 and 18 by one, uh, Paul. I get it. But really, that was a huge loss for the program. They were really expecting big things, and I'm not saying they can't finish 10 and one, but that's a big, big shot to their program. Washington losing to Montana, another big deal. And of course, I can't really consider this an upset per se. I didn't see the game. It kind of looks like, obviously, it was a defensive struggle, but Georgia defeating Clemson, five versus three. You know, Clemson, it might not have, uh, probably would not have hurt them as much as if Georgia, uh, put it this way, Clemson's the power of the ACC. They'll still probably overcome this loss and win the ACC and play in the championship. Georgia may be losing had they lost that game. It might have been a tougher uphill battle for them, knowing the SEC and knowing that you can't even afford losing like this out of conference in the SEC. Because I've told you, it's the preeminent college football uh, conference. So any loss by any of these, LSU getting beat out in UCLA. And UCLA wasn't even ranked. But they're one of those programs that's always good. They're, they're always lethal, no matter what their, their record could be, 1-10, and 10, and they can be just as lethal as if they were 10-1. and 1. Because they're, they're one of those programs in college sports that, will always get really good talent and can pick you off anytime that you're not looking. And I think there was a combination of things why LSU lost. Maybe the venue, going to the Rose Bowl for the first time. Maybe the change in uh, time. Maybe, unfortunately, uh, the hurricane having an impact on the program. So all those things could have been uh, factors in them being upset by UCLA. The other fact that I haven't talked about is maybe UCLA is pretty good and they've been overlooked. And maybe this win over a ranked team, a huge ranked team, a top 10 ranked team, 
maybe propels them into uh, tremendous success this year. Rutgers in 76, 12 and 0, they do face three of those schools. And I mentioned they play UMass and Connecticut. Like I said, the big games that they probably played were Louisville, Tulane. And they did play them at the tail end of the season. Now, I'm going to leave this up to the viewers. I did a study of all the teams. <laughs> I went through them. You can see it, all the pink. Even I have color-coded charts, just like my cartoon was saying, okay? And I did the records of all the teams that each team that was ranked in the top 20. And I really discovered this. Pitt, which was number one, Pitt actually finished uh, playing opponents, probably their biggest game. And here's where I'm saying you know, Pitt beat Notre Dame that year in the opening contest. Uh, Dorsett, I recall, it was really a, a – they just ran – he ran over uh, the Notre Dame defense. I think he had like 200 yards in the game. They beat Notre Dame like 34-21. It kind of knocked Notre Dame from any chance at playing for the national title and probably was a catalyst for really pushing uh, Pitt over the hump. But Pitt, their final uh, the score or, or the records of their final of their opponents was 63, 69, and two. They did play, interestingly enough, Louisville. I believe that Rutgers destroyed Louisville. I want to say that they beat them. I'm going to give it to you right now. Pitt beats, and this might be, and I know scores are relative and all the rest of it. Pitt beat Louisville by a score of 27 to 6. Rutgers beat Louisville later in the season by a score of – they were beaten by uh, Rutgers 34 nothing at Rutgers. So you can see where maybe the poll, pollsters are saying, yeah, maybe Rutgers deserves it. They shut them out. Meanwhile, I'm not saying that Pitt struggled with them, but – they did allow points, and it was a closer game in terms of point spread and all the rest of it. These are our factors. The interesting thing is Colorado, which was uh, which finished ahead of Rutgers that year, along with Oklahoma State, interestingly enough, and for, for when I was a kid, Oklahoma State was never really that good in football. They were, and of course, Oklahoma State, they got two things going against them, Texas and Oklahoma being in the same area. Um, but Oklahoma State and Colorado, which finished ahead of Rutgers, they actually had, um, you would consider the most competitive of all the schedules. Now, they did have a couple of tomato cans on the uh, ledger, but I I'm going to give you some of the teams that other schools played. Consider this, though. Oklahoma State, played North Texas, which finished 6-5, and five, and they also played – let me just see if I can find them. Yeah, they played North Texas. All right, they finished 6-5 and five, and were kind of in the same realm as Rutgers. And they played another team, uh, Tulsa, which lower level. Tulsa's one of those teams, though, they can pick you off anytime soon. They were 7-4-1. Uh, they also played UTEP, and UTEP, for all extents and purposes – is really not a football school. They've never. I've never seen them win more than ten games. I, I don't think I've ever seen in all the years and all the research where they've had a ten-win season. I could be wrong in that. But UTEP was one and eleven. So even if you subtract that one and eleven season, Oklahoma State is playing teams that basically were 74, 49, and four. Colorado played Drake. And the University of Miami, Florida, which was going through a, a dark period basically in their history, but they were three and eight. But I'm taking Drake out because they were not in the same realm. They were kind of like here, and then you have all the other teams. Uh, but they were not on the same level. They were one and 10. So if you took them out, they're 75 and 49. So their records actually improve in terms of strength of schedule. Like I said, Pitt was 64 and 69, I believe. Yeah, 63, 69, and 2. Rutgers, the overall record of their 11 opponents, 
was 42 and 70. It wasn't even a 400 winning percentage for uh, Rutgers opponents. Now, again, here's what um, Burns' season actually did, though. And let, let, let's be fair about this. Rutgers going undefeated on the um, really jumping off Rutgers basketball season going 31 and 2 and 26 and 0 during the regular season. Then you went to the NCAA. It really propelled and was a catalyst for talks of a Big East or an Eastern Conference football uh, league. And Paterno was really uh, a guiding force towards that. But think about it. Rutgers, Boston College, Syracuse, Maryland, they were hoping for. Pitt, obviously, Temple, probably Cincinnati, West Virginia. Probably those were the schools that they were looking for, for and Penn State. Those were the schools that were looking to maybe get together. And I really believe this is what happened. It never came to fruition for Joe Paterno. But talk of these independent schools aligning and becoming one, I am probably sure that other conferences were fearful of that because they do have one thing going that probably the Big Ten, the Southeast Conference definitely, the Southwest Conference at the time, the Big Eight at the time, and maybe not, well, I'm, I'm going to leave the Pac-8 out of this. But one thing that all these Eastern schools, had they merged into one conference, was the media. And I'm sure it's scared all of the other big uh, Big Ten, Southeast Conference, ACC powers. Maybe not so much, like I said, the Pac-8 because you got L.A. Maybe so much the Chicago area. But remember, they're really dominated by Michigan and Ohio State. And those two, you know, Detroit is not the media outlet that New York and L.A. So Burns is going maybe 12, uh, 11 and 0 that year. Really probably starts everyone thinking in this area and Joe Paterno wanting something to happen really spurs what we see today on the college football landscape and college basketball as well because from 76 you get the Big East Conference forming in 1979 all right it's really strictly a basketball conference Pitt does join in football Boston College and Syracuse were already in it as original members. But look at what we see today. Rutgers bounced around from the Eastern Eight in basketball, independent in football. Then they jumped to the Big East. Well, they actually went the Eastern Eight becomes the Atlantic Ten, and then Rutgers jumps to the Big East. Then they leave the Big East, and they join the Big Ten, along with Maryland and Penn State and Nebraska. So you can see how all of maybe now these are isolated incidents, isolated events, but they kind of have a domino effect on what you see on the college football landscape today. And it's forever changing. And I've said that before. How do I know that? Well, Texas and Oklahoma abandoned the Big Eight or actually the Big 12 and are joining the SEC like a fellow colleague at one point, Texas A&M. So all this changed. Now, interestingly enough, I was looking and doing some research on this. Burns wins 78 games in his career for Rutgers. And of those 78 wins, he does have a big, big win against Tennessee. He actually records most of his wins against what I would consider the lower level. But let's take that in context, okay? Against the um, big schools, he actually was 28 and 31. And when I say the big schools, I'm talking Syracuse, Louisville, Virginia, Pittsburgh. I'm talking about the ACC, the SEC, uh, the Big Ten, the AAC, the Independents, and the Mountain West, the Pac-12, and the Sun Belt. Well, I don't even consider it a Sun Belt. But actually, Burns is not bad. He's 28 and 31. Probably the highlight of his career was defeating Tennessee 13-7 and losing in the Meadowlands later on 7-0 to Alabama. 
at one point, he won like 17 games in a row. And then all of a sudden, I actually think this. I think that Rutgers was kind of like this little secret on the East Coast. They win. And it is it propels them into notoriety. But it also begins probably a descent for Frank Burns because now Rutgers were scheduling bigger schools, trying to get a bigger name on the college football landscape. And they probably never really, really adjusted. And unfortunately for Burns, he went from here um, and he gets fired as he has like three seasons where he goes three and eight, three and eight and all the rest of it. But that 1976 season was just unbelievable. Nation's number one defense. They win the very first college football game played at the Meadowlands. They actually uh, played Columbia at the Meadowlands in that season. They, they finished the season playing in the Meadowlands against Colgate. And they have some big wins. Let's face it. They, they play Tulane, Navy, and Louisville. I'm not saying that's like playing Alabama, LSU, and Houston. But at the time, it's still big time for Rutgers. As I stated, if you were playing this ledger today, nobody would even put you in the top 40 if you're undefeated playing these teams. But at the time, like I said, they are one of two teams undefeated. Now, you say to yourself, you're coming in with the nation's best defense, allowing fewer than 10 points a game, actually 7.4 points per game. You're undefeated. However, the schools that you play are combined, what did I say, uh, 41 or 40 and 71 overall, or 40 and 72 overall. You can understand why there were maybe some teams like BYU, which finished 9 and 3, or teams like North Carolina, which finished, I think, 8 and 4 that year, or even um, a team like... Yeah, I said BYU and and uh, and North Carolina. They both finished nine and three. And here's who BYU played. And you tell me if Rutgers' leg, uh, Rutgers' schedule lines up with BYU's. They played K State, Colorado State, Arizona, San Diego State, Wyoming, Southern Mississippi, Utah State, Arizona State, UTEP, New Mexico, Utah, Oklahoma State. Now. There's a couple of terrible teams in there. K-State and UTEP both were double-digit losers. They collectively went 2-21. and 21. San Diego State, though, was 10-1. and one. And Oklahoma State, which I believe they lost to in the uh, one of the bowl games, was 9-3. and three. So you pick your poison. You know, does, does BYU deserve to be in the top 20 over Rutgers? Here's North Carolina playing in the ACC. They start off with Miami Miami of Ohio. All right. They played Florida, Northwestern, Army, Missouri, North Carolina State, East Carolina, Wake Forest, Clemson, University of Virginia, Duke, and uh, Kentucky in a bowl game. I think they didn't play in the Liberty Bowl. I think they played like in something like the Blue Bonnet Bowl or something like that. Their collective record was 59-71-4. BYU's was 56 and 79. Do they belong in the top 20? And interestingly enough, that Missouri team, it's kind of interesting. Missouri, I do believe, uh, first week of the season, I had them here. I believe they stunned USC. Let me just check that. I know that they faced USC very first game of the year. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, Missouri stunned USC that year. USC won all the rest of the games, including Michigan in the Rose Bowl. That Missouri team was unranked. But take a look at this. This is the teams that they played, that Missouri team. They were 6-5. and five. And this is where I think we are studying the schedules more. And you consider this. Here's the schedule that they played. First of all, they played not one, not two, not three. They played seven ranked opponents. And here's an oddity. They actually played three teams. 
that were ranked 14th when they met them. They actually played this. They probably had the toughest schedule, arguably. They played USC. They played Ohio State, which was ranked second, and beat them 22-21. They beat USC, which won the Rose Bowl and finished second in the land, and they beat them handily 46-25. They beat Nebraska when Nebraska was number three, 34-24. They lost by a point to Oklahoma State, 20 to 19, following Nebraska. But right before, they beat Colorado, who was ranked 14th, and they beat them 16 7. And then they played Oklahoma and lost by seven points, 27 20. And then, really, in their big war, I, I guess they call this uh, their civil war or the battle between the states, they lost to Kansas. 41-14. That's incredible. So if you just took that out, and if you could just reverse the Oklahoma and the uh, Oklahoma State game, this team now is 8-3. and three. But take a look at that schedule. And the other team that they played, Iowa State, they lost to, they finished in the top 20. Illinois that year was 5-6. and six. Uh, so, but still now consider that on the surface, six and five, you look like a mediocre team, but say to yourself, who played the, the tougher schedule 12 and 0 Rutgers with three Ivy league opponents on it. Okay. Princeton, Cornell and Columbia or Missouri who played USC opening night. In California, Illinois, Ohio State. At Ohio State, they beat them. North Carolina beat Kansas State at K-State, even though K-State was terrible. Um, Iowa State, Nebraska, in Lincoln. They beat them in Nebraska. Lost to Oklahoma State by a point in Stillwater. Beat Colorado. Lost to Oklahoma in Norman by seven points. And then, of course, just totally, I, I, I think maybe what happened with the Missouri-Kansas game, if I was a betting man, if I was kind of like seeing this and knowing the history, I think Missouri was probably just flat, maybe exhausted, maybe beat. And it was just, they weren't up for the game. It just happens. And maybe just twists and turns, everything goes wrong on that night. You could argue maybe everything went right. They had to have a pretty good team because not only do they beat perennial top 10 schools like USC and Ohio State, but they beat them on the road. And the first three weeks of the season, think about that. How they lose to Illinois, again, maybe it's a downer from defeating the number eight school at the time, USC, and maybe uh, expectations of playing Ohio State. But they beat the number 18, the number two team, the number 14 team in the land. They beat the number three team when they played them at that time. They beat the number 14 team at that time. And of course they lose two games to ranked team. They actually were what? One, two, three and oh, four and oh, four and one, five and five and two. I tell you, they really make a case for maybe even potentially being a top 15, maybe even a top 12, maybe even if you wanted to push it a top 10 because of the teams that they defeated that year. And so you have a team like Missouri, who's not even on uh, the final top 25. And they're saying to themselves, what must we do? And here's Rutgers opponents playing Bucknell, Cornell, Lehigh, Colgate. And their three most competitive are Tulane, Louisville, and Navy, all finishing with the same record of four and seven, 12 and 21, I believe. I believe. So that was the thing. Now, the good thing about Rutgers, and this is why I think that Frank Burns, 28 and 31 against what we consider the perennial powers, does have a big win later on against Tennessee, loses a, a, really a classic game. It could have gone either way, the Alabama game, 7 nothing. Even when they went to Alabama, he didn't, or Rutgers did not embarrass themselves. I always made the point with Rutgers is that probably – 
they played really good football against overwhelming odds. And uh, really, he was the, the catalyst for why Rutgers is in the Big Ten today. So Rutgers fans, I know he took a lot of heat for the last couple of years of his career at Rutgers, but Burns is probably the most significant football coach, I would argue, in their history, Greg Schiano or not. And he's done wonderful things for uh, the Scarlet Knights, but I don't know whether he would have occurred had it not been for Frank Burns and that 12-0 season, an undefeated season by the Rutgers Scarlet Knights way back in 1976. And those final opponents were Navy, Lehigh, Louisville, Yukon, UMass, Columbia, Cornell, Bucknell, Colgate, Princeton, and Tulane. This is Will O'Toole wishing you all a great Labor Day. See you next week. And once again, I thank you for allowing me to come into your homes and talk all things sports. See you next week.